Charles Moore, a marine researcher, once said, all the king's horses and all the king's men will never gather up the plastic and put the ocean back together again. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening and welcome to the third episode of Cohabitat, a project initiated by the Rotary Club of Colombo East and carried out jointly with the Wildlife and Nature Protection Society. As Sylvia Earle once said, it's the worst of time, but it's the best of times because we still have a chance. This on its own enunciates the importance of seminars such as these to create awareness among general public about rather the importance of protecting and preserving marine life and wildlife. Now, uh, today we have a very special guest here with us today. Um, he is a conservation biologist specialized in terrestrial and marine mammals. His uh, research mainly focuses on the lesser studied species of marine mammals, um, such as the Indian Ocean humpback dolphin, the Indo-Pacific finless porpoise, the sperm whales, and the dugongs. Now, um, he also currently serves as a regional member of the IUCN Species Survival Group, Serena Specialist Group, and he has 25 years of experience in the marine sphere, uh, sphere across, spanning across rather, an array of marine conservation and research organizations, such as the Center for Research on Indian Ocean Marine Mammals, the um, National Aquatic Resource Research and Development Agency, the Whale and Dolphin Conservation UK, to name a few. Further, he is an author of the field of identification guides to the marine mammals of Sri Lanka. Now, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, presenting you our speaker for this evening, Mr. Rather, Dr. Ranil Nanyakara. Hi, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Ranil. Thank you so much for uh, being here with us this evening. Uh, no worries. <laughs> Uh, um, doctor, your uh, my uh, your video is uh, not visible. It's, you still can't see it, or um, is it a connection it's tough, isn't issue? It? I think so. Well, um, we'll proceed like this. And I'll do it. Yes, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, doctor. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Welcome, no worries. <laughs> okay, uh, so, um, doctor, I understand that you have a presentation that you've prepared for us. So, That's right, um, yeah. I'm giving this flow up to you. It's all yours. Please go ahead. Uh, well, to give you guys uh, a brief, uh, I first speak on the uh, sperm whale project that we have been conducting in Sri Lanka for the last 10 years. And uh, basically uh, the project is, the focal point of the project is the Eastern half of the Gulf of Mana. And uh, we, this uh, project was instigated in 2010 after the war ended, because prior to 2010, this area was inaccessible to uh, researchers and other scientists. So the main focal point of our sperm whale project is um, we want to get a rough consensus and idea of their codas. That's a clicks because uh, that has a unique. Uh, uh, as I go along the presentation, you'll uh, get uh, get a uh, in depth uh, knowledge on that because uh, it's really the codas differ from region to region. So we want because there hasn't been any proper studies in Sri Lanka on the sperm whales after the 1980s. So we want to get a idea on what sort of uh, what sort of animals are found here are they coming from different parts of the world or do we have a unique population and at the same time uh, we are uh, maintaining a photo id catalog and also to get a rough idea of the social units and group size because nothing is basically known in the indian ocean and also the factors influencing the aggregation because you get a lot of uh, in uh, the uh, late part of March, early part of April, you get large pods, what you call super pods, who come into uh, the eastern half of the Gulf of Mana to mate, to carve, uh, and so on. So we want to uh, get a understanding as to why these uh, animals come into this particular area of the Indian Ocean. And 
to give you a brief on the sperm whale, it is the largest predator, living predator on Earth. And it, is, it has the largest brain and it also emits the uh, loudest noise in the animal kingdom. And we also have two other sperm whales, that's a pygmy sperm whale and the dwarf sperm whale, uh, but they differ vastly from the actual, uh, the main sperm whale, because the, the dwarf and the pygmy belong to a genus called Kogia, whereas uh, the main sperm, but the sperm whale, the, our focal point is on the uh, macrocephalus, uh, five seta macrocephalus, that's the great sperm whale. And the small two species are much smaller, whereas the uh, great sperm whale, the females grow to between 11 to 12 meters, but and the male grows to over 60 feet, 60 to 65, between 60 to 65 feet. And whereas the pygmy and the dwarves are a mere three to four meters in length. And uh, the sperm whale is very famous from uh, Hermie Melville's classic uh, Moby Dick. And uh, I think most of you would have read it and because it was part of, I don't know about in uh, Sri Lanka, but in uh, some parts of the uh, globe, it is actually part of the uh, GC O-level English literature. Uh, it, they, they cover the, that novel as well, Moby Dick. And also the sperm whale was again uh, made famous by uh, one particular individual who sank the uh, whaling ship Essex in 1820. And that is, that is what really uh, got Hermine Melville to write this book on Moby Dick because he covers most of what the uh, incidents that took place with the uh, sinking of the Essex. And also um, the reason why we chose the sperm whale is because no one really knows because now only we're getting to understand their social structures and how complex they are and because they were basically hunted almost to the verge of extinction in certain parts of the world. Uh, luckily for Sri Lanka, we didn't have that issue, but um, in uh, during the 19th century, the 20, early part of the 20th century, we did have Soviet whalers coming into close to our waters to basically our uh, exclusive economy zone, but they took, but we don't have a, a proper idea as to how many animals were taken uh, during that uh, period. But uh, places like Peru and uh, that area, the males were basically killed because the males are larger. And the reason why they go after the sperm whale is because of the spermistic oil uh, that is basically used for soap, then uh, to manufacture candles and uh, sometimes it's used for perfume as well and uh, so is ambergris that is the uh, basically the excrete of the sperm whale which is covered uh, the, sorry the squid beaks are covered with uh, mucus and these are excreted by the sperm whale and these are used for uh, cosmetics and also for perfumes so it's, it's a highly valued even today there are people who spend like you know 20 30 000 us dollars to purchase these uh, what they call ambergris and uh, like I mentioned earlier, their social structure is very, very complex. It is similar to elephants, chimpanzees, because um, uh, the uh, in a generally in a pod you get between ten to fifteen individuals in it, and mainly it consists of uh, maternal pods. What you call maternal pods, because the males once they are about uh, eight between eight to ten years, they leave the maternal pods and they go to colder waters, and um, when uh, the uh, during the maternal pods basically uh, takes care of one female's young and suckles them as well till the female goes and you know dives deep down because they dive to about say between 2,500 to 3,000 feet uh, when they're foraging. So while a group now, if you say you get a, for example a group of 10 to 15 individuals in one pod, till half of them uh, go go and forage, the other stay on the surface uh, looking after the calves of the uh, females that are foraging. So that way it's very, very complex. And we are now only we're getting to understand what sort of uh, social behavior and complexities there is within these animal groups. And also uh, uh, research carried out in other parts of the world has shown that, that the sperm whales have a unique accent. When you say accent, they use codas and clicks to uh, basically communicate. They have it's unique in the sense it differs from place to place and from region to region. And in fact, within the Indian Ocean itself, the animals in Madagascar have a different uh, click pattern to the ones found in Sri Lanka. 
so that differs and also though they do come into now say for example the sri lankan waters and they go back they do not that the their uh, clicks do not the, the form of the click does not change so i have a, a small uh, video for you guys to so play so you get a rough idea as to what we mean by these codas and clicks now this is from sri lanka this is the sound of our, the sperm whales found in our waters And uh, the R clicks go as click, 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 and then you get a sudden burst of four to five uh, clicks in uh, close proximity to each other. Whereas now, for example, in the Mediterranean Sea, you get a click, 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 and just the four clicks. Whereas in Sri Lanka, you get the uh, two to three clicks with, uh, say, about a two, three second gap between, and then you get the sudden burst of four to five clicks going out. So that itself, when we compare with other uh, uh, clicks and quotas from other regions of the world. It to it's totally different, and we have, in fact, we are in the process of um, writing up a paper, a few uh, publications, peer-reviewed publications on these uh, uh, uniqueness of the clicks found in Sri Lanka. And in fact, we might have a unique population of sperm whales as well as with the blue whales. And the other part of our study is basically photo identification. The reason, when I say photo identification. Uh, we use photo ID to um, record a particular individual animal over seasons. So now, for example, on the left-hand side, uh, you can see at the bottom, it says 2011 fluke uh, 007. So that means this animal was first recorded in 2011. Uh, fluke in the sense the ID, uh, the ID feature is its fluke, the tail, and 007 is... The, it's the seventh animal that we have ID'd in 2011. And though on the right hand side, again, it's an animal from uh, 2011. Again, it's a fluke, but this particular number is 2012. I mean, uh, 0012. So that shows that that animal was recorded uh, in 2011, but it's the 12th different individual that we have recorded uh, today. And these two individuals have from 2011 to date, we have seen them in every season. And they come in all the time, and these are two females. And also, there are other scars that we use to ID, but it's not as um, sort of uh, uh, accurate as the fluke. We, uh, like you can see in the dorsal fin, this particular animal has a few uh, scars. And then also, this animal, the one closest to us, not you can see part of his jaw missing. Again, this but this is a male, and this male has been coming into our waters again from 2012 to date. It has been seen every season. Uh, that is between uh, end March to April. That is the time of the breeding and the calving season in the eastern half of the Gulf of Manor. And their social units again is very very complex. So what we have studied and what we have seen. Uh, the animals that are found uh, throughout the year in our waters are basically maternal uh, pods. And like I mentioned earlier, the males during uh, around about February, they start coming in from the colder uh, waters, from the equatorial waters. They start coming into the eastern half of the Gulf of Manor to mate and calve. And again, this is a, a pot of females. That, though we see only four on the surface, there are there was about eight to ten individuals below the uh, much deeper in deeper waters now at least about another 10 meters or so beneath these animals and uh, you can see there's sort of a trail of smoke that is that animal is defecating because uh, we were in the water and uh, when they uh, get uh, a bit uh, scared and agitated they defecate to sort of uh, uh, ward off the pr uh, predator And again, this is uh, uh, again one of these maternal pods. Uh, the, these are the females that were sticking at the surface with the calves, while the rest of the pod were uh, down, uh, you know, diving deep to forage for food. And when uh, we try to get a 
through our studies, we are trying to get an understanding of the diet as well, which is very difficult when it comes to sperm whales. And uh, these two these animals were basically regurgitated by the sperm whales at different, uh, again, in the eastern half of the Gulf of Manor, in different years when we were observing these animals. And um, we have also, when uh, a sperm whale washes ashore, we try our best to go and, you know, sort of uh, uh, inspect its stomach content. And this is a few, uh, uh, this is basically a sample of the stomach contents that we've been analyzing. These are all squid beaks because their main, main um, uh, prey are types of squid. And uh, they also are supposed to feed on the giant squid in other parts of the world, like in New Zealand, Australia, and Japan, and so on. So this is just a sample of the squid beaks that we've been analyzing from the sperm whale stomach content. And why there is killer whales is we are also having a sort of, it's not exactly, it's part of the sperm whale project because uh, during this period when you get the sperm whales coming and aggregating in you know, uh, large numbers in the eastern half of the Gulf of Mena, we also get the transient killer whales coming in. Why is it transient killer whales? The transient killer whales are the ones that are known to feed on other marine mammals, whereas the resident and the offshore species really feed on fish and so on. So uh, we have been observing because every year you get the transients coming in and we have been maintaining a catalog of the transient killer whales as well. Um, as you can see, these are the characteristics and the identification characteristics of each individual that we have seen. These are just two individuals. To date, we have uh, basically ID uh, about 30 individuals, and four, five, about five of them uh, have been uh, recited in the Gulf. Uh, I mean, the Gulf of Oman as well, in the Red Sea, and also there are two, uh, two to four individuals that have been seen in the waters of Maldives as well. So we are trying to um, maintain a catalog and sort of collaborate. We actually we have collaborated with the Indian Ocean uh, Orca project. So we basically uh, give our whatever animals we record, we take their photographs and we share it with them. And also at the same time, we maintain our own database as well. And uh, this is why I have a photograph of the dugong is we also have a project on the dugong. Again, it's in the same area uh, in the uh, Gulf of Mana and the Pork Bay. Uh, the dugong is uh, one uh, unique animal because it is the only uh, herbivorous marine mammal and uh, its last foothold in Sri Lanka is the Gulf of uh, there was basically the Pork Bay and the Gulf of Manar because they are seagrass feeders they only eat seagrass and the grazers and the seagrass beds are basically being destroyed and so is the dugong population is basically being uh, decimated because they are hunted for their uh, meat Mm, and also uh, the meat fetches are very, very high price in that particular area. As the, a kilo of uh, dugong flesh sells between about 1,200 to 2,000 rupees per kg. And so we are trying to, uh, not, uh, we are trying to basically um, create awareness among the fisher folk in that particular area. It's from uh, the Park Strait up to Jaffna. We are trying to uh, create awareness and uh, make them understand the importance of dugongs because uh, dugongs being grazers, they feed uh, in the seagrass beds and when they defecate, their fecal matter basically is like fertilizer. It helps the seagrass beds flourish and also at the same time, the seagrass beds are uh, nursery grounds for a myriad of species of marine organisms like, you know, skate, rays, uh, trevely, shark and so on. So, if you basically, you know, if the dugong is lost, that particular whole ecosystem will collapse. So what we are trying to do is, you know, basically um, change the mindset of the fisher in that area and, you know, get them to understand the importance of these species. And in that same area, we have another two unique species that we've been studying and they are, just as the dugong, they are endangered species. One is the uh, Indo-Pacific finless porpoise. It is a really small uh, species of cetacean, about five to six feet in length. And it's because sometimes uh, people get um, confused and mistake them for the dugongs because uh, the finless porpoise and the dugong, they both lack a dorsal fin. So we've been studying the finless porpoise. Again, it's a neo-show species. So it comes into uh, 
sort of conflict with Fisher and also at the same time, not only conflict, they are threatened by the activities, different, different activities of the Fisher folk in that area. And they are bycatch, uh, they, very often they get caught in nets. And in fact, uh, even uh, beach per se in nets, they're caught on a regular basis. But now since we have been conducting these um, awareness programs, we have seen that, uh, or at least people who do the monitoring for us have observed that once, if these animals are caught, the fisher generally put them back uh, to the ocean. Uh, but there are certainly one or two instances where they have actually um, uh, slaughtered these animals for their meat. And the other unique species, the Indo Indian Ocean humpback dolphin, uh, which till recently we thought that the only population we have is of uh, uh, in in the uh, Putlam Lagoon. There was a population in the Putlam Lagoon, and we thought that was the only uh, population that uh, we had in Sri Lanka. But uh, our research has shown that there is uh, another population that is found in the Park Strait. Uh, and also, but the, that the, the particular population that is found in the Park Strait moved to and from um, uh, between India and Sri Lanka. And the other uh, population we have is in the uh, uh, eastern part of the country, uh, around Batiklo, Panama, that area. So that is a new population that we discovered just last year. So we are basically uh, carrying out a research because um, we can see there's some morphological differences between the population found in uh, this particular area and also in, uh, uh, but it differs from the Putlam population. And this is a, the, the reason I have shown you uh, red individuals is so that you get a rough idea as to what the animal looks like. Because out at sea, there's only you only see the dorsal fin and a bit more as they surface. But uh, you do not see the whole animal as a whole. So sorry that I had used these disturbing photographs. This is of a uh, humpback dolphin that was uh, a victim of dynamite fishing in the Putlam Lagoon. And that is basically, I just want to give you guys a brief on what and what we do. And, you know, and if you guys have any questions, I can answer. We can take it from there. And yeah, thank you. And we also have these um, responsible whale watching programs that we've been carrying out in Miris, uh, Kalpitya and Trinko. So I just thought I'll just chuck these flyers there so you guys, you know, you know what, and what we do to sort of uh, make people aware of uh, you know, being not only earning an income, but being responsible as well and giving something back to the species. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ranil, for that very informative and very interesting presentation. I'm pretty sure uh, everyone learned a lot, especially even I, I learned a lot uh, through that presentation. Um, so, Doctor, are you ready for some question and answer? Yeah, no worries. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> My first question is, um, in your opinion, and since this is more or less your expertise, uh, why are whales becoming more and more extinct? Mm, the reason, but when you, uh, there are only certain species that are really uh, going into extinction or facing extinction. Um, but uh, the, all causes are basically anthropogenic. It's human-induced causes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like, you know, there are certain populations now, for example, like humpback whales, the populations are increasing in certain areas of the world. But when you take the southern right whales and the uh, bow-headed whales, those, the po populations are ba basically uh, dropping. So you can't, uh, like, you know, as a whole, you can't say that all sort of, you know, the all situations are facing extinction. It really depends, but it's all to do with different, different. Now, for, say, for example, if you take the larger whales, it's to do with ship strikes, uh, ghost nets. Uh, then also at the same time, the um, uh, sort of, what do we call it? The insecticides, the pesticides that are accumulating, microplastic, and so on. And also at the same time, when you, uh, there is a sort of competition between us and them for resources as well. Because, you know, like, for example, the the fishing methods that we use and what we're doing at the moment uh, as a whole globally is unsus unsustainable. So we are basically taking everything that is there, but you know, there is, we are not leaving anything for them to uh, eat as well. So that component is also there in a big way. So I would say, yeah, 
those are the main threats faced by them and when it comes to the smaller situations of course it's by catch then some are uh, killed uh, for the meat uh, then uh, some individuals are basically uh, used them flesh is used for shark long line fishing so it's whatever it is and also at the same time it are different different causes like uh, they have, some of them have sort of uh, carcinogenic cancer causing um, components in them like few animals that we have uh, carried out necropsies we have seen that they have carcinogenic uh, substances in them so that again is because of human activity mm -hmm. so it's basically really? you know, as a whole it's which is just driving them to extinction. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, uh, humans are a very common factor in all of these problems. <laughs> so yeah. uh, moving on to our next question, Doctor. Um, recently, very recently in Parnadura, there were more than 100 whales that were washed ashore. Um, why do, um, is, this, uh, is this phenomena called beaching? And um, like, why, why does this happen? What causes this phenomena to happen? Uh, one thing that, yeah, it is called beaching or stranding. Uh, the particular species that came ashore is what we call the short fin, fin pilot whale. Because you have two species, you get the long fin and the short fin. The long fin is found in temperate waters and the short fin is the ones you found in tropical waters. So out of that is a short fin pilot whale. And they are very, they are prone to stranding. If you, On a global context, they are the animals that is most likely to strand if anything goes wrong. So they are, you know, just before this, a few months ago in uh, Tasmania, there was a huge uh, pod of uh, pilot whales that stranded, but was over 400 plus animals. Mm -hmm. And then it was the Sri Lankan incident and not even a few days ago in New Zealand, again, there was a hundred plus pod of uh, pilot whales that stranded. The reason being is they basically follow a leader. So that's why they, they follow a leader. So the, whatever the leader does, now say for example, if the animal feels sick or whatever and he comes towards the, the beach, then the rest of the pod follows it. So that is the biggest problem. So th this is a global phenomenon. Like everyone has been observing it, probably any person who has been doing research on cetaceans for uh, all over the world. The pilot whale is one of the species most likely to strand for the slightest, slightest uh, mm -hmm. uh, sort of change in weather, even I'm not saying that, you know, this is not, not nothing to do with, you know, sort of a human induced thing or sauna or whatever. But what I'm saying is, as a whole, these guys, the pilot whales, they easily strand. They easily strand. And, uh, but they, they will, uh, after about two, three days later, there was a lot of uh, act, naval activity. And uh, in Kalpitya, normally uh, you don't get, you know, large pots of blue whales, but we were like observing between eight to ten individuals in a pot, in a sort of a three to four square kilometer area. So it might, that naval exercise might have had an effect on these animals, but generally what they do is, why they come ashore is they basically follow the pot, they follow the leader. So the, the leader moves, comes, in, comes towards shore, the rest of them follow. So that is a phenomenon with the pilot whales, which we still are learning as to why this is done. That's, that's very that's, interesting. That's very interesting. Uh, so, Doctor, moving on to our next question. Um, in your um, expertise, what are the biggest issues that uh, the dolphins and the whales have to face nowadays? Uh, what I feel is, adding with the fisheries activities, we also have, uh, for the especially the larger whales, like I mentioned earlier, the ship strikes. And to add to all that, we also have uh, the now we use sonar for everything because uh, though it doesn't uh, sort of affect the uh, baleen whales because we have many tech cetaceans, they're categorized into two uh, groups. One is the uh, baleen whales where you get the blue, the fin whale, the brooders whale, the humpback whales. And then you get the other category, which is the tooth whales, where that's where you get the uh, sperm whales, the pilot whales, the dolphins, all of them come on the category of tooth whales. And these guys use sonar to navigate. And they also use sonar, biosona to bioacoustic sonar to forage as well. So when you have uh, an alien sound coming in, what happens is they get disoriented. So sometimes like they can strand, then you get in instances where they have got a uh, shock by, you know, hearing this where they have you know, when they're foraging deep down, where they have surfaced uh, really fast and where they've got uh, 
the bins. That bins again, even uh, uh, divers also get it. That is when you come too fast and carbon uh, dioxide builds up in your system. So they get that as well because the several individuals that we have basically uh, carried out necropsies have shown that they have bends, but that so that again is a huge issue. So what I see is now, and also certain types of fishing gear. And there's also fisher who basically you know discard certain nets when it's damaged out at sea, and that is a basically a ghost net, and those are like death traps. So it's like you know all these little little things basically compound the threats manifold you know there's so many things in your vast area but the main is the uh, these fishing activities and also there are certain areas where in sri lanka where we have noticed where they use types of nets that are banned so those cannot be detected by uh, the animals uh, sonar as well so those are the threats that uh, they face and also uh, microplastic is becoming a huge problem Though we think that the plastic that we get out in the ocean is from the ocean is actually what's on land that basically washes down to the sea. So to basically stop all this and to protect them, we have to first stop, you know, polluting uh, on on land. Okay. Um, so, Doctor, our next question is: um, Now, as the society, what can we do to save our marine life? Uh, but as a conservation biologist, I would say not marine life to save all life. Basically, is yeah. we have to. Though there is a lot of uh, things, you know, like sort of rules and regulation gathered and everything down in black and white. We should also make an effort to sort of you know conserve it. So what we could do is the little little things, like you know, uh, say for example, even the uh, plastic bag that we sometimes see people throwing out of their uh, car windows. If we keep it and you know take it and dispose it of it in a proper way, now another huge issue we are seeing is uh, face masks because of COVID-19. There are a lot of face masks now all over the place and in you know waterways and even in the ocean. So again, the disposing of that and also to be a bit more conscious, you know, like you know, if I know it's very hard to say, you know, it's easy to say said than done, but you know, to be, even if you do go shopping, you know. Make sure that you take your own bag if you go and you know do your grocery shopping and make sure that you know leave that bag behind. You know don't use the plastic bags. Use you know sort of recyclable bags and also uh, paper bags and so on. So those are the things you can do. And also at the same time, sort of uh, we can also. I know it's a bit difficult to uh, sort of create awareness and you know inculcate something to to a sort of a mature person, but we can. You know, change the mindset of the younger individuals. So, if you know, if you're really conscious, if you now itself, you sort of, you know, uh, tell the do's and don'ts and to your, you know, children, your younger siblings, your nieces and nephews, that will really, really help. And you know, in the long run, perhaps when we are not there, perhaps you know, they'll do something to protect uh, <laughs> mother. Yeah. Uh, so, doctor, this is our last question to you. Um, what? Is the message that you would like to leave with our audience today? <laughs> uh, what I would say is, I tell this all the time, and I tell it to everyone as well, even to you know when I go for lectures. Uh, this is basically this planet, this whole universe, this galaxy does not belong only to us. There are other uh, organisms that play uh, just as important part as us, and it is you know one big wheel, like what they say, the circle of life. So. One spoke falls out, the whole system will collapse. And rather than going in for sort of uh, products of commerce and economic benefit, you know, at the same time, it's good to go because you know nowadays money is everything. <laughs> but you know, it is good to sort of what if we do do it in a sort of responsible way. Because uh, a very good example is I was speaking to a professor just the other day, and he was saying that. Um, uh, People don't understand, and you know, they use insecticides, pesticides, all that, and the insects, the bees, uh, and so on. Those animal, those all those insects are missing. But at the and at the same time, those very people use that substances are complaining, saying that the crop is not very good, that the the, the crop is uh, falling. They don't, they don't have a good yield. So the reason they don't have a good yield is because they're using so much insecticides and pesticides and killing the natural pollinators. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that would be my message. Is you know. Be responsible and give something back while taking. Yes, 
uh, be responsible. That is a very <laughs> good message that people need to um, actually follow. Um, and with that, we wrap up today's session. Thank you so much, Dr. Anil, for taking your valuable right. time and being with us here today. Um, we definitely learned a lot from today's session. Um, so to our audience, thank you so much for being here, taking the time to be here. There will be a very short video played right after this session. Please stay tuned. Uh, President Clinton once said, we know that we are, protect, uh, we are protecting our future when we protect our oceans. With that, ladies and gentlemen, this live session has come to an end. Have a very good night. It's always an anxious moment getting in the water with cetaceans. They're exquisitely beautiful creatures and for all their size, quite calm and placid. Under the veil of what Herman Melville called the ocean's skin, these animals were playing, doing more than that, in fact. Spring is the time when sperm whales seem to come to this part of the Indian Ocean to mate in these deep blue waters. A pair of young males approached us. They're very curious creatures. They seem to find human beings interesting. And as we swam with them, it was impossible not to be impressed with their beauty, their strange, elegant shapes, so supremely in control of their environment. Silent, majestic, able to dive for a mile deep and stay down for more than two hours as they search for their favorite food, squid. They are apprehensive of humans and their boats, even if they dwarf our little vessels. Again and again, we went into their world, a topsy-turvy world for us, a world in which we have no control but a world where the whale reigns supreme. And when they dive, raising their flukes vertically out of the water, it's almost impossible to imagine that you were sharing the sea with them. These waters were alive with other creatures, olive ridley turtles and spinner dolphins, also in mating mode. Then everything changed. There was a large conglomeration of sperm whales, an estimated 100, perhaps 150 of the animals. We were right in amongst them. They are right there, see? Are those dolphins? Oh, no, right. no, those are not resources, they are much bigger. Like All skill whale, I think. They seemed to be moving towards an appointed destination, gathering about 30 animals in a cluster at the surface. It was an astonishing encounter. In front of us was just wall to wall whale. They seemed to be agitated. We could hear them blowing and raising their flukes. Suddenly, another dorsal fin broke the water. Looking down into the water, Drew could see what the animals were. Not dolphins, as I thought, but killer whales. Orca, the apex predator in the ocean.
we could hear the clicks of the sperm whales versus the hunting clicks of the orca. We saw the orca's dorsals riding high in the water, circling as they dove under the sperm whales. We could hear two groups of whales reacting to one another, the hunters and the hunted. For almost two hours, we watched the orca circling around the sperm whales. Sometimes it seemed that they were about to come up in the middle of the animals. Although when we saw the footage later, we realized that sperm whales had been diving down in a kind of column beneath them. Underneath the water, these great animals with their meter thick blubber were presenting a united front against this attack. They were continually opening and closing their jaws, both a sign of stress, but also of aggression. It was the most astonishing sight. From the surface, you could see the intensity of the animals gathered together. We've never seen such a biomass in one place. Suddenly, the orca started to appear under our boat. We realized that their behavior had changed in another way. Both Drew and I have been on many whale watching operations and trips, but this is the only one I can remember when we became an object of intense scrutiny by these sentient, brilliant hunters. We thought we were watching one group in the distance, a ways off, but then suddenly with a plosive blow, we realized there was another group right beside us. Had we frustrated their hunt? Were they actually turning on us now? It seemed impossible. But when this tight-knit clan of sea wolves turned and banked underneath us, it was quite clear that their intentions weren't just based on curiosity. The data that Rannell was gathering both visually and acoustically, would provide vital information for a scientific study of this unique behavior. Perhaps it's the first time it's been observed in such detail and at such length. Were the animals testing us or were they trying to work out what we were? Whatever the truth, what happened next was extraordinary. Drew and I and the rest of the people on our boat had never experienced. On one side, four orca came charging directly at our boat. It was quite clear they were using well-known techniques employed by orca in the Southern Ocean, where they use a compression wave to tip an ice flow on which a seal might be lying. One of the orca females had a calf with her. Orca have a matrilineal culture. Hunting techniques are passed down from mother to calf. We thought perhaps we're part of one big training exercise. At one point, the whales approached us. We felt a sharp blow. It was clear we'd actually been struck by the animals. The whales repeatedly charged our boat. It was, one must admit, both an exhilarating and a terrifying prospect. What would have happened if those whales had succeeded in their attempt to turn us over in their deadly game? <laughs>